very challenging. There's a lot of different, like, puzzles and word problems, even when you're in first grade, when you're just learning to read. There's word problems. So you're breaking up different steps. It helps with executive functioning skills. Because then when you can you can start to teach your the students like, okay, I have three questions. What is the information? So then it's allowing you as the educator to also help them break up problems. Wow. Yeah. Does Singapore math work and is it yes. applicable across all of the age and grade levels? Yes. Yes. Um, what I have noticed and seen from my experience is once they get to high school, they'll use a different type of program, but they've already gotten the building blocks from there because they are, the concept of math has now been instilled in them. Now they understand the language, they understand the why, and so they're able to kind of flourish in whatever program that their high school is um, utilizing. Has this method been around, used in the United States long enough so that there are measurable results that we Studies. can compare? There is, there is, there's some great studies. Um, I know Massachusetts is a big component of, of using it, and they had some great, you know, reports and self stories about um, their classes and on standardized tests, the improvement that they've seen. Um, it has only been brought into the United States um, since 1990. 1998, um, and then there was no marketing, so it would kind of just become word of mouth. Sounds like my I show. There's no life. marketing. You just kind of get <laughs> it out there, and hopefully people will like it and spread it around for yes, you. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I mean, but it works. It works. It works. Um, you know, I think that the past five years, it's now become a household name in the education world, meaning if I go to a meeting, if I'm meeting a new um, teacher or a new school, I like to, anytime a student of mine, um, I take on a new case, I always like to go and take a tour of the school. Um, I do that for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons is to kind of get this feel for the environment um, and kind of see, okay, what does this environment look like that they're going to be sitting there and having their educational career in? And I always bring up, what's the math curriculum you guys use? What are the curriculums you use? And Singapore math comes up a lot of more teachers are understanding this. It's becoming a household name, and it's very exciting. When we return, Dr. Michelle talks about labeling kids and how to get the most out of those parent-teacher conferences. We're back in just a moment. Welcome back. You're listening to Mindset and my conversation with Dr. Michelle Sines. The key to parent-teacher meetings and helping your child get what they need from the learning process is, according to Dr. Michelle, prevention and not crisis intervention. The idea and the concept of disability, specifically in the context mm -hmm. of learning disability, the idea that we designate anyone, especially a kid, as learning disabled seems to be horrible, for lack of a better term. I know that's very ineloquent, sure. but it it conjures up this less than um, I've got, you know, uh, missing half my brain is gone, sort of. Uh, right. I'm, I'm a partial human being, not really complete and as good as um, vision. Talk about that idea in, in the context sure. of one, your training, um, parents who, you know, their kids are young, they're going through school, they may be told your kid has a disability. That's got to be shocking and jarring. How, what is the sure. most useful way to think about that term so it's not a negative impact? I chose the name of my website for exactly what you just said, Flexible. Your brain is the most incredible organism that we know in the universe. There is so much that we have yet to learn about it, and it has to do with flexibility. You know, if your student comes home and they're not understanding, you know, the, the logistics of what their teacher is asking them via reading or math, it has nothing to do with your student, <laughs> your child. Um, maybe not even the style of teaching that your te the teacher is instituting. It's how they think. 
their brain, the way that they see the world, the way that they look at a problem. A lot of this has to do with you have to understand what it is that they see. When you're sitting down with your child and you're reading at night, it, it can't just be about reading the words because you're in your brain painting this beautiful picture, this beautiful memory or this movie playing. And that movie might be completely opposite of what your child is picturing. So it's asking them those concrete questions. Like, what do you think will happen next? Making the predictions. What are the characters? What are they like? Um, how do you associate with them? It's kind of having that discussion so you have a better idea of how they're viewing the world. Um, there's a lot of things parents can do, especially if they're having parent-teacher conferences and they're coming back and there's something negative. The biggest component I am is environment. If a parent just goes into the classroom and looks at the environment, is there a lot of stimulation up on the walls? Does your student get distracted by that? What's going on in their desk? Is their desk clean or is there a lot of clutter everywhere? Um, are they sitting all the way in the back? Maybe they should be sitting in the front. Who's next to them? Are they sitting next to people who are going to distract them? Or are they sitting next to people who are good role models? The number one thing is environment. So if, if I would say, even before school starts, <laughs> don't wait for the teacher to say, oh, they're falling behind and we're not sure what's going on. No, be proactive. Meet with the teacher ahead of time. Find out their learning set, like their teaching style. Find out the curriculum and look at the classroom and kind of prepare your students about where everything is located, what it's going to look like, and trying to set them up to succeed the best way that you can. And I would suspect that the idea of environment extends to home as well. Absolutely. I mean, a student should have a separate area to study. He should not be, they should not be studying on their bed. The bed should be a place to sleep. There's a lot of associations that go along with that, you know. You want to make sure that they're sleeping enough. And so when they're on their bed, it should be associated with now it's time to relax and sleep. So I would never recommend studying on the bed. It should be at a place that's separate. Um, ideally, it would be a chair and a desk only because that's what they are used to at school. Um, I do have a lot of students who need to go back and forth, which is great. So maybe they're sitting at the desk and they're working for 20 minutes and then they kind of need a break. So they go to the couch and they read for 20 minutes and then they go back to the desk. You kind of have to be flexible. You have to figure out what works best for your child. Disability, that term. It's, mm -hmm. it, I guess if I had my way, it would be eliminated from our vocabulary altogether and especially right. When we're talking about kids, whether it's physical, emotional, or otherwise. However, it's something that we have. It's, it's, it's ubiquitous in our educational system. They say disability. I should hear what? My child has a different learning style. What, how do I think about this? It's going to yes, allow right. me, it's going to empower me. It's going to help me help my kid. Right. Okay. So I'm a huge component on preventative measures. We never want to be in the crisis. We don't want to have crisis intervention. We want to have prevention. So anytime you're, before you even go into that meeting with your, with the teachers, you need to have an agenda. You need to have a list of questions all the time. Parents come and they only get like 15, 15, maybe even 20 minutes at max. And in those 15 to 20 minutes, apparently they're supposed to find out all these things about their child and it blows my mind. I, I think I tell the teachers the same thing. I don't ever want them to have a session or a meeting with a parent without having an agenda first. So parents need to be bringing in. They shouldn't just come in with this kind of, oh, we'll see what happens. No, they should have a list of questions, a list of concerns if they have any to be for, brought forth. And Hopefully, a teacher will never say that to a parent to say, oh, I think they have a disability. There is a way they should be approaching that. But if something does happen where it's being brought up, the best way to think is, let's find out data. Okay, why are you saying this? What have you noticed? Is there any common themes? A lot of times, children do better in the morning than the afternoon. So is this subject matter only given in the afternoon when... You know, their child is already beat and exhausted. 
that's a, a question you want to ask. You want to ask, okay, what are your the expectations? They should be able to give you a list of expectations for whatever subject they're just talking about. Where does their child meet the stand for those expectations? You can find out a lot of information when you have a clear, concrete, detailed list of what they should be doing and what they are providing. Maybe it's writing. Oh, well, they're supposed to be writing five sentences a day. Your student's only writing three. Let's look at that. What is, what's going on? Are they not having a clear idea of how to format the sentences? What if we gave them a template? So you want to really be an investigative. You want to just ask questions. You don't, the disability mark really doesn't mean anything without knowledge about where this is coming from. And so the biggest thing is just ask a million questions, get the information as much as you can, and then be your child's investigator and try to investigate what it is that's really going on and then try to tackle that, that thing. Last question, along with any final thoughts that you have, um, Dr. Michelle Sines is my guest. We're talking about um, how kids learn, what parents can do, this incredible program called Singapore Math. Is it ever too early to start paying attention to how your child's mind works? No, I think that um, you always want to give them the exploration time to kind of explore but I think you also want to make sure that you're showing different things. I mean, a child who is, tends to lean on science or he's asking lots of questions about the cosmos and watching science videos and I just want to watch science. That's great because that's an interesting thing for them. But you want to make sure you're also introducing other things because you want them to remain flexible. You don't want them to get, like, fixated and rigid on one specific thing. You could always tie into, oh, well, did you know that cooking, you use a lot of chemistry in cooking. Oh, let's, you know, why don't you help me with cooking right now? And we can look, oh, look, there's lots of math in cooking, too, and we have to, you know, use some measurements and everything. So there's different things that you can kind of channel their love of whatever it is and find it in different avenues. Final thoughts, Dr. Signs. Every child's mind is beautiful in its own way, and it does not matter if their way of thinking is different from their peers, their siblings. A lot of times you'll find siblings that live in the same exact house have different ways of viewing the world. That's okay. You just want to figure out how that individual sees the world and encourage and foster it as much as you can. Because I can assure you that whatever their learning profile, it has nothing to do with their intelligence level whatsoever. You just have to find the right way to kind of pull it out of them. Dr. Michelle Signs, that's spelled Michelle, M I C H E L L E Signs, S A E N Z. Her website is Correct. FlexibleMindsNYC.com. It was an absolute joy to speak oh, with you. Yes, it was yes, so yes. much fun. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Sam Collins, healthcare reporter with ThinkProgress.org, and Dr. Michelle Signs. You can find her online at FlexibleMindsNYC.com. That's it for today's show. Check us out at MindsetShow.com, and remember, Dare to see mental health differently because understanding why we do what we do makes us all do better. See you next week.